so um, this is uh, lesson number, uh, let me see where I am, lesson number six on the book of Revelation. And um, so uh, let's just get right into it. The book of Revelation is all about what's going to happen uh, before Jesus comes back and what it's going to look like when he does come back. And uh, I just wrote this down today, the holiness and purity of God will not allow sin to go unchecked. How many know that's true? In an individual, a nation, or in the vast universe, sin must be judged. Uh, Lucifer, back eons ago, we don't know when in eternity past, uh, sinned against God, took a third of the angels with him, fell from heaven to the earth, corrupted the earth, and um, it was recreated in the, uh, in the six, six days of creation. And then Adam came along, created by the hand of God, sinned against God, a curse came on the earth, Satan became the god of this age. He has a legal right to be here. He got the God-given authority that God gave Adam, Adam and Eve, and he's been using it to steal, kill, and destroy all these thousands of years since the creation of man. And the good news is Jesus is coming back to right every wrong. And everything that will not submit to his lordship, he's coming to judge. And that's what really at the end times is all about. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. This is J.B. Phillips' translation. God has allowed us to know the secret of His plan, and it is this. He purposed long ago in His sovereign will that all human history should be consummated in Christ. That everything that exists, that includes me and you, in heaven and earth should find its perfection and fulfillment in Him. When you see Him, you will know even as you're also known. Everything you ever wanted will be right in front of you. Won't that be awesome? So aren't you glad he's coming back? So the book of Revelation, the, the, uh, the li- literal word revelation, apocalypsis, as we get our word obviously apocalypse from that, and uh, it's a transliterated word. It means, uh, it means an unveiling. I mean, so, so, so the future has a veil on it, and Jesus is basically taking the veil out of that. So... Uh, the uh, five previous times I've spoke on this, March 13th, March 27th, April 10th, July 10th, July 17th. We've got a lot going on on Wednesday nights here in various ways. So uh, we, the second and third Wednesday nights we dedicate to talking about this book and going over it uh, line by line. And uh, so we'll get through it perhaps before Jesus comes back. What do you think? So we've talked about the classifications of people in the Bible that God speaks of. We're talking about four covenants that you need to understand, really to understand what God's doing when Jesus comes back. Uh, and then God gave Daniel a revelation in Daniel uh, chapter 9 of 490 years of Israel's uh, future. And uh, uh, 483 years of that has already come to pass. There's seven years of uh, Jewish time yet to be fulfilled as God revealed to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27. That's how we know there there's seven years, quote, so to speak, of Jewish history left. There's seven years that uh, just before Jesus comes back um, uh, in his second coming that God will deal with the Jewish race again. The Jewish clock will tick again. And then many of the things revealed by Jesus, by the Apostle Paul, uh, by Peter, uh, by the Old Testament prophets, and by, um, by Jesus to John in the book of Revelation will come to pass. So we've talked about that. And then July 10th and 17th, uh, we went over the first chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation 1. Today's an introduction to the seven churches. And my heart tonight is I want to change your thinking about reading Revelation chapter 2 and 3, these seven churches. It's not just churches in history past, but they're but they have something to say to us today, and I think you find, may find it interesting. So let's read uh, back, let's back up and backtrack Revelation chapter 1. This is New King James, start with verse 10, because he kind of sets up talking about the seven churches, and then we'll go from there. Uh, and so he says, verse 10, Revelation, when I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and, and what you see right in a book. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His uh, head and hair were white like wool, uh, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. Won't he be amazing to see? His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, 
And his voice is the sound of many waters. We've gone into detail on all the meanings of all of this in past lessons. Uh, he had in his right hand, verse 16, seven stars out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Uh, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last. I'm he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I'm in, and I have the keys of Hades and death. Write these things which you've seen, and the things which are, the things which will take place after this, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. These seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands you saw are the seven churches. So, uh, John had been... Um, Exiled on, in a penal colony for prisoners of the of, of Rome, the state of Rome, uh, for some time, and that that uh, Patmos is in the Aegean Sea. I've flown over it many times, coming from London to various places, uh, you know, uh, west of there, and uh, <clears throat> and he was there because uh, because of his Christian faith. Domitian was a, just a really mean Roman uh, emperor, and uh, he imprisoned John there, and he thought he thought he had. He'd, he had just done something really terrible for John, but anywhere you put John, how many know, in, regard, if you walk with God, regardless of what happens, God will turn something good out of something that looks like oh, it's awful. And that's what happened to John here. So Jesus appeared to him while he was on the island for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he talked to him, he talked to him about these seven churches in uh, Asia Minor. It's not like we think of Asia today. It's modern day Turkey. And these churches were all just kind of conglomerated together. And he talked to him about uh, what would happen in those churches. And he talked to him about his second coming. So uh, here's the skinny. These church, uh, seven letters were directly from Jesus to seven churches. Now, now, I don't know if you thought about it this way. This is, the, this is the only time in the whole Bible that Jesus wrote directly to a church. The epistles are letters written that... that that the apostles wrote to churches, but these, these seven letters written to these churches, Jesus is writing to churches. And it's important enough that he appeared to John on that island and, had, and, and, and John penned what he heard from Jesus for us to read. So we can glean several things from that, you know, uh, letters from famous people. I just happened to look some up today. You can Google that later, not now. And find letters on the internet from f famous people. And some of those letters are worth a lot. Like a letter from George Washington to someone. Or Abraham Lincoln. Or someone even older. And you can find these letters. And they have them in museums in very pla various places. Those letters are worth a lot. If it's a notable person. Or here's Jesus has has written letters to seven churches. And they're, and they're framed for us to see throughout the church age. And... Uh, and they're worth something. They're very valuable to us. So he says here, uh, he, he mentions to the angel of the church of. Each letter is addressed to an angel of the church. You know, the Greek word for angel is angelos. And, um, and it means, it literally means messenger. It could refer to a physical angel, but sometimes in the scriptures, you've got to figure out by context, is he talking about an angel? Sometimes that word angelos is a messenger. And so it's a human messenger sent to take a message to a group of people. So every time you find the word angelos in the New Testament, you've got to figure out, <clears throat> is this a, a real literal angel or is it a human and the only way you figure that out is by context. And in this one, it's still, you, you, it could go either way. He could have uh, written to the angel. That is, there's a spirit entity, an angelic being that helps pastors of churches. Perhaps we have one helping us here at Victory Church. Wouldn't that be cool? I've actually had people see them. I've never seen in the spirit realm that way. Not like that, but I think they exist. Or, you know, my take is, I, I think he's writing to the pastors of uh of literal churches here. Anyway, uh, it was dictated to John by Jesus, and um, and and Jesus has some things to say to these churches. Um, uh, these letters um, are for those churches then, but they're also for now. So let's talk about that a little bit. Here's some statistics about the seven letters. Jesus spoke well of each church, all seven of them. And he talked about their faithfulness and what they had accomplished to help him. But then in each church, Jesus also reprimanded them uh, for some spiritual neglect, for some failures that they had had. And in each church, Jesus urged them to correct problems 
that currently existed in the churches. He has also encouraged each member of these seven churches to, um, uh, to be overcomers. That is, to hang it out, stick it out, I mean, you know, through thick and thin, and, uh, you know, be faithful to the end. So he knew, and here's what we do know, Jesus understands the challenging environments that we live in. How many know that's true? And he knows what we face in the 21st century. He knows what we face in 2019. He knows what's coming up in the years beyond this one, the next year and the next year. And so, you know, we can trust him that he's going to help us with the pressures that we, uh, that we face. And, uh, and he leaves no excuses for us to walk with him. He wants us to walk with him through the good and the bad and through the challenges, whether it's fleshly challenges or spiritual challenges. How many hear me? And then also uh, in every church, there are people who are committed to God. And then there are people who are disobedient and just won't listen. And he commends the obedient, but he challenges those that won't listen. There's some pretty tough things he has to say. So, um, you know, some people ask the question, if there's so many churches throughout the world, uh, why would Jesus pick out these seven churches and then and then talk to John about seven churches that existed in the first century. And why, why would he put that in, in, in writing? And why would he have John put that in writing? And uh, so why these seven churches? Well, these seven churches, again, were fairly close to each other. They're in modern-day Turkey. You can go on a map and find them very, very easily. All that's uh, available to all of us. Uh, perhaps that was a postal route. And it was just the sequentially easiest way from go to one church to the next um, uh, uh, John was the pastor of the church in Ephesus uh, before he exiled, and um, and he perhaps had some kind of authority over all the other churches around, you know, that little uh, postal route, perhaps. And so maybe that's why Jesus says something to John about them. And um, uh, 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 those churches were founded by uh, Paul the Apostle. Aquila and Priscilla helped him. He was there for several years. And then church history says that the Apostle John actually pastored, uh, pastored the church in Ephesus and, and perhaps had some, somewhat of a spiritual authority over the various churches there. And, um, and, you know, John was the last apostle that lived. He was the very last one to die. He was the only one that was not martyred. Uh, tradition says he was, uh, they tried to kill him and couldn't kill him. Uh, tradition says that they tried to boil John in a vat of oil and it just wouldn't work because he so loved that nothing could touch him. Isn't that awesome to think about? So anyway, he was banished to the uh, GNC. There he was. He lived to be an aged man. He was the last apostle. And so, you know, if you think about being a believer, you know, Jesus, uh, 30, what, 3 AD or so, um, died and was resurrected. The church age began, so the church had been in force for decades. And really, if you think about being a first century believer, they looked to the apostles for direction because the apostles were eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus. And they, and they, li- they heard his voice. They saw him glow on the Mount of Transfiguration and, and they saw him when he was resurrected from the dead. They were eyewitnesses to him. So they carried a lot of weight. And John, think about the aged Apostle John and the weight, spiritual weight he carried and, and how much the believers in his day respected him. Well, when John died, he was the very last apostle. What's the church going to do? Perhaps it's a gift from Jesus to us that when the last apostle that saw him alive died, Jesus left some letters for us too so that we would know what to do and we would know what he thinks and we would know how we can move forward. How many hear me? So, you know, the directional perhaps that way as well. Uh, you'll find the number seven in these, um, uh, in the whole book of Revelation quite a bit. The number seven stands out very clearly. There's seven letters to the seven churches. And uh, I've mentioned this before. There's a reoccurrence of uh, the number seven in Scripture, and it has a significant meaning throughout the Bible. Seven is the number for perfection. You know that. Um, uh, seven is found in Revelation 54 times. John speaks of seven. I'm not going to look at the, I've got it in my notes, but uh, the Scripture references seven spirits, seven stars, seven lamps, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven heads, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven golden bowls, seven mountains. I mean, on and on. So um, the purpose of Revelation is to reveal Jesus during the last seven years of this dispensation before he comes back in his power and glory. Seven, again, is the number for biblical perfection uh, in God's uh, creative work of creating the earth. Uh, He rested on the seventh 
day, right? Hebrew calendar, the seventh month. You may not know this. In the Hebrew calendar, you got three Jewish feasts that are really important. And all three of them have to do with the second coming of Christ. And a lot of people think that Jesus may be coming back in the fall of the year. Yeah, not this year, but I'm just saying a year. Get rid because of these feasts. So this in the seventh month, of the Jewish year, you got the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, all in that seventh month. See, there's rhyme and reason to everything God does. Uh, the seventh uh, year was important to Israel when it came to the land resting. In Leviticus 25, God said, plant your crops for six years, but let the land rest the seventh year. And there's the word, the, the number seven again. And then, and then there was the year of Jubilee. So you got seven weeks of seven years, 49 years in between the year of Jubilee, 50th year in Israel's year of Jubilee. If you were a slave, if you all had debts, uh, you were no longer a slave on the 50th year and all your debts would pay. Wouldn't it be good for somebody to do that in America? You could, yeah, you know, all that credit card stuff and all. Yeah, yeah. anyway. Um, God showed Daniel 490 years, 70 times 7. 77, 70 weeks of 7 years, 490 years of Israel's existence from the tis time uh, into eternity until... Uh, the end of this age, at least. Uh, and there's seven years left of the 490 years, as I mentioned. So the number seven, there's a, that's a big deal to God. Four perspectives of this letter uh, to the seven churches. Uh, it was obviously written to seven churches that actually existed in the first century and had something specifically to say to them about how they should live with the challenges and the persecutions they face. But then also these letters, they also apply to every church in every generation throughout the entire expanse of the church age, however long that is. And I'm sure they never in the world thought that it would be 2,000 years from the time. And I'm sure John, when he saw Jesus on that island, he never thought it would be 2,000 years for it would take that long for Jesus to come back. He probably thought he was coming back really soon. But see, these letters, they, ex they, they go the expanse of the church age. These letters also really are, uh, for us at least, uh, meant to encourage those living at that very close of the church age. And it more and more looks like we're that generation. How many hear me? And I think God's trying to get us all ready and stir us up to really give our all for Jesus in the days we have left. And to help the church in this last era of time deal with the enormous pressures uh, that we face with Antichrist persecution coming now. Let me say this, there's about a third of the church, about a third of the church worldwide that believe that we're going to be raptured away and will not experience any of these seven years when the Antichrist will manifest at some point there. And there are about a third of believers worldwide that believe that we will not be here. We will be raptured away. There are people in our church that believe that. And you know what? I'm glad you believe that. And I absolutely, 100% hope you're right. I believe that, preached that for 25 years. And God really began to deal with me um, nine years ago. And my theology changed. I, I do believe we're going to see a portion of the Antichrist rule. That's not, see, that's not something that's popular to say in American churches. Now, now, Christians worldwide, if you go to other cultures, they do believe. And if you look at church history very closely, a majority of believers in church history and, and the early church fathers believe that the church would go through a period of time when the Antichrist was here and they would have to deal with the effects of his reign. Now, I'm challenged if, 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 if I'm wrong and if the people are right that we're going to be raptured away before he's even revealed, then you know what? Everything I'm saying is completely mute points and it doesn't matter. But if something happens and we're still here when the Antichrist manifests himself in the Middle East and, and he has some kind of influence worldwide, how much he has in America is yet to be determined. The jury's still out on that. But uh, if he's... Uh, if we're still here, you might want to come back and hear some things that, that, the, uh, that John the Apostle, that Jesus revealed to these seven churches, because they would definitely apply. How many hear me? So uh, anyway, um, there are uh, seven things that Jesus said to these seven churches that definitely apply to the people that will be here under that beginning time of the Antichrist reign 
just before Jesus comes back. I do believe the church will be raptured away. We'll talk about this another day. I don't have time tonight. I believe we'll be raptured away before the worst comes, but we'll see a portion of his rule and reign. And, uh, and to that end, I want to mention uh, each of these churches, there's something that Jesus said to them that would apply to the church living just before Jesus comes back. So to the church in Ephesus, that would be called the loveless church. Jesus said, I will come to you quickly. How many know, how many know right at the right time, he'll come and take us out of here? To the, to the church in Smyrna, we'll cover all these churches in detail. The persecuted church, he said to them, you'll have tribulation for 10 days or a short duration of time. It's not, it's not going to last forever. It's just going to be, t- it's going to be a little bit difficult, but you'll make it through it to the church in Pergamos, the compromising church. Jesus said, repent or I will come to you quickly to the church in Thyatira, the corrupt church. And we'll cover it another day. Hold fast to what you have until I come. That is, don't give up to the church in Sardis, uh, the dead church, as it's referred to. If you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know the hour I will come upon you. And that's, those are the people that have no idea what's going on around them and they're not looking for Jesus to come back and they get swallowed by the culture around them. Philadelphia church, the faithful church. Jesus said this to them because you have kept my command to persevere during the great tribulation under the Antichrist. I will also keep you from the hour of trial. And that hour of trial mentioned there is the day of the Lord judgments that come after the church is raptured away. He said, I'll keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world. And again, speaking of the day of the Lord that comes to test those who dwell on the earth. And then the Laodicean church, the lukewarm church. Uh, Jesus said to the lukewarm church, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also sat down with my father. Now, there are those that believe these uh, seven letters have to do uh, incrementally with, uh, with the history of the church age. And, and each letter has to do with a segment of the church age all the way from the first century all the way up to now. The problem with people that believe that is that's subjective to your view of history. And, and I don't know how you can quantify which part of the church age Jesus is talking about with each of these seven churches. So I think uh, the most practical way to interpret the seven churches and their letters are there were to churches then that existed to there to all of the body of Christ through all the church age and they specifically speak to people who will be here before Jesus comes back and will be the people that will see him come back and that could be us so how many think we ought to listen so before I finish tonight again you know, they got some pretty good amazing things to say that Jesus said to the church in Ephesus so look at let's look at that one first again Paul founded the church in Ephesus and we're going to read in just a minute Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 and but let me make some uh, some uh, comments about this and um, Paul again founded this church on his first missionary journey he pastored the church in Ephesus for about three years and he stayed there really longer than he did at any other church and uh, and then history as I said earlier says that past, uh, John pastored the church in Ephesus before he was in prison I said all that to say this was a really spiritual church I mean if you got if you got Paul founding the church and then John, uh, Paul pastoring the church for his first three years and then, and then John, the apostle John actually pastoring that church. They had some good word, don't you think? So you got to think they were fairly spiritual believers and they had some really solid doctrine. So look at Revelation 2, 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things say he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven Golden lampstands. Now those lampstands refer to churches. How many know Victory Church is a lampstand? Do you know God's designed that we be a lampstand, a lamp, a light in our community? Who determines how bright our light is? You do. So you know, I often ask myself, Lord, I wonder how bright Victory Church's light is in the Raleigh community. What are we doing individually to shed and shine our light as we're working, going to school, living in our neighborhoods and doing the things that we do? That's a good question, isn't it? Isn't it? Then Jesus said, I know your works, your labor, your patience. Now think about that. Jesus knows your works. He's cumulatively talking about that church, but how many know every church? Jesus knows what that church is about. But he also knows each individual, and he knows our individual works. 
Some people today uh, lend the thought that our works are not important. How many know our works really are important? They don't make it. They don't save us. They don't save us from our sins. But they do. Our works do position us for where we will be in eternity. You want to go read that in First Corinthians chapter three, Romans chapter fourteen, where we stand before the judgment or reward seat of Christ. Really, quite a quite a thought. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. He said something positive about them. You've tested those who say they're apostles and are not and found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake. This is a great church. They said you've not become weary. They love the word. They walk with God in purity. But here's a problem. You know, they had walked with God for so long and had some of the, you know, crim, crim la crim of, of the, of, uh, of the uh, apostles uh, in their church. And but they came, became so familiar with the word and so familiar with spiritual things, they got stale. And how many know the longer you walk with God, listen, the ch- biggest challenge you're going to have is the newness wears off. It's sort of like a friendship. Once you meet somebody and they have a, over, a, a wonderful personality and you love talking with them. But once you get to know that person, and you, then you begin to learn their idiosyncrasies and their peculiarities and some of their flaws. Well, that person ain't what I thought they were, but I still like them. Right? So the newness wears off. Well, that's what happens to us spiritually too. It's easy to grow stale, and that's what had happened to the church in Ephesus. They had, they had grown stale. They had, they had left their first love. They quoted Scripture. They knew the Word, but their deep love for Jesus uh, just became really commonplace. And uh, they quoted Scripture, but again, their deep love was missing. And often, you know, what happens is if you become stale in your, in your spiritual life, judgmentalism a judgmental attitude is easy to have how many hear me so so you got you got people that have been in the church for a long time and often like the pharisees they're the ones that are looking their down their noses on the new people who aren't as pure and holy as they are how many know those attitudes are bad so jesus had something to say he said this nevertheless i have this against you ephesian church that you have left your first love don't you know it's like slap in the face Jesus is talking to him. One thing I like about Jesus, and you know, the best friends I've ever had in my life are the people who didn't just pat me on the back and say, how you doing? Everything's good, wonderful. No, it's the people that patted me on the back and said that, but then also said, can we talk? Because I'm challenged with something that you're doing. And you know, those are the people that have helped me the most. You know, three years ago, I hired a I hired a John Maxwell guy to come and help me be a better leader than I had been being in uh and, you know, the first thing he did was made me mad. But, you know, now, now I love that man. Randy's a good friend of mine. Because, you know, he didn't tell me what I wanted to hear. He told me what I needed to hear. And you know what it did? It changed my life, y'all. And I'll forever be indebted to him. And I've had other people in my life say, Mitch, can I be real? And every time when I was a little boy, I told you a few Sundays ago when my dad said, Mitch, I got a bone to pick with you. I knew my daddy loved me. If your parents, if you really love your children, it's not all sweet candy all the time. Sometimes there's a challenge. And that shows your children that you really love them and, and your friends as well. So here's Jesus. He says, I have this one thing against you. You don't love me like you used to. Right? That's what one translation says. Can you imagine Jesus standing in front of you? And he's looking you in the eyes saying, you know, you don't love me like you used to. What happened? What happened between us? Now, he doesn't move and he doesn't change. Can you imagine how that make you feel? Woo-hoo. Deuteronomy 6, 5. And this is the basis for what Jesus said. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. Isn't that good? And then Jesus quoted that Matthew 22 teacher. The religious people said, what's the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, and I love his reply. He makes it so specific. You must love the Lord your God. See, it challenges me right now when I'm reading it. With all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. So for me, I break it down. He wants my thoughts, all of my thoughts. The ones I don't verbalize and the ones I do. He wants all of my motivations. 
So see, I ask myself, does he have the motivations of my heart? Are they right? Are they pure? Are they selfish? Or are they really to help and bless others? Why do I do what I do? He wants that. He wants my thoughts. So what do you think about all day? Where do your thoughts go? What occupies your mind? What kind of things do we read? What kind of things do we listen to and ingest? If, he had, if he's Lord, he wants to have something to say about that. And in our culture, if he has something to say and we are obeying it, it has to be that all throughout the day you, you, you choose, I'm not looking at that, I'm not reading that, I'm not going there, I'm not... Li-. How many know that? If you're honoring him and, and you're loving him with your mind and then your emotions. He, he wants to be Lord of what I feel and what I think. And how many know your emotions can hijack you quite frequently? Is that true? And make something that's not real seem absolutely real. Uh, for the first part of my life, my emotions hijacked me in all of my relationships. And I thought nobody liked me. I had a self-defeating attitude and it came upon me because of things that happened in my childhood. And God had to work as I, as I learned to love Him with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, which includes my emotions. He set me free from that feeling that I had that people didn't care, people didn't like me. Nah, nah, nah. You know what I'm saying? And he said, All, love the Lord with everything inside of you. This is the first and great commandment. So, and so he said to him in verse 5, Remember therefore from where you've fallen, repent, do the first works, or I'll come quickly and remove your lampstand. You won't be the light in the community that you once were. Maybe I'll put your light completely. Maybe your church will dissolve into nothingness. Maybe it won't exist anymore. Because you thought you had everything, but you've lost the most important thing, and that is your love for me. So he said, do something about it. Repent. He said, remember. Here's what he said. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. And he said, repent and do the first works. So God's constantly challenging me. Y'all, when I first came to Jesus, I was head over heels. I was reading my Bible, you know, on my lunch break at work. I got up in the morning, read my Bible. I read my Bible before I went to bed. I was thinking about God. I was listening to uh, praise music all the time in my car. You know, it was just that way. I was meditating on Scripture all the time. And anytime I get off kilter just a little, he's like, remember that? You remember that? Remember what you used to do. I tell this to married couples. If you're troubled in your marriage and things aren't going well, do you love each other? Are you treating each other the way you did when you first met? Susan, I'll be married 40 years next month and I have to ask myself, am I wooing Susan the way I did 40 years ago when we weren't married and we were dating? We dated for 13 months and I was thinking about her every day. I could smell her perfume. You know, I could see her face when I closed my eyes and you know, it was all about Susan. Well, it, it ought to still be that way. And if you want a good marriage, you've got to go back and do what you did to foster the relationship to start with. So what about us now? What, what, what's your relationship with Jesus look like right now? Is it, is it like it was when, when, you, when you first came to Jesus? Or like the Ephesian believers, have we become complacent with the Lord? You know, Jesus wants first place. And you know what? I think it's more challenging now than it ever has been because we have so many things to take our, we, to take our time and our attention. And uh, I'm constantly bothered by the fact that people are on this thing right here all the time. Is that true? And, and, and I think Jesus would have something to say about what we do with ourselves. And so I think it's a big challenge to put Jesus first and, and stay with your first love. The next thing he said, and I'll close here, Revelation 2, 6. But this I have, Jesus said to them, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life. That is, you're going to live eternally which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So, deeds of the Nicolaitans, that's also mentioned, and we'll mention it again, church of Pergamos, he said, I have a few things against you, verse 14, Revelation 2, because you have those there who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols, commit sexual or immorality. But uh, thus you also, thus you also have and hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. 
Now let me just read this in one of my study Bibles. I'm just going to read this because it cuts to the chase and we're done. The Nicolaitans, listen to what this guy says. The Nicolaitans had given in to compromise with the pagan or ungodly society around them. They taught, you don't have this in the notes, guy. Uh, they taught that spiritual freedom and liberty allowed people to engage in immoral behavior without fear of punishment. Are y'all here? Did you know that's being taught today? Did you know that's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? He goes on to say they felt that because of God's grace, or that is, that is his unearned favor, love, and mercy, these behaviors did not affect one's spiritual salvation or relationship with Christ. This person says the New Testament clearly contradicts this belief, telling us plainly that such persons will not inherit the kingdom of God. God hates false and deceptive teachings and that claim that we can be saved uh, and, at the, um, at, and at the same time live immoral lives. So again, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is alive and well today in the church of Jesus, particularly in America. And Nicole, I've been talking about this all summer long. We've talk, we talk about the love of God, but we don't talk about the purity of the God that we know. And it's this pureness it's his holiness that is so attra- oh, very, very attractive. And it's, holy, it's his holiness that even though he loves us without Christ will keep us out of heaven. How many understand that? So again, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans are those who, who give in to the cultural trends around them, to, uh, to the disregard of what the Bible teaches clearly. We're in those days today, y'all, and the Doctrine of the Nicolaitans is alive and well. And that's why Jesus is speaking to us. Here's what I found out. First thing he said to him, come back to your first love. You know what? If you love Jesus with everything inside of you, you don't, have, you don't want the other thing. 